for those who aren't familiar with Arnie, uh, I will tell you, he is, uh, he's not just a de-expedition doctor. He's also a really excellent operator who has been, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've operated a lot overseas. I've, I've done CQ worldwide from like 21 zones, but all of my stuff was fly in commercial. I didn't have to get on ships for a week or anything like that. Arnie, Arnie does the hard stuff. And, uh, and he's done this over and over and over again. So, uh, you know, not only are they unique medical experiences, just unique radio experiences overall. And, uh, He's he's been very very uh, generous with his time and his skills, and I look, really look forward to hearing what you have to say, Arnie. We're going to talk a little bit about um, how I prepare for being a de-expedition doctor, uh, the the medic on a uh, on a trip, and um, uh, <clears throat> I've been on fourteen of these major de-expeditions, and I. I think I've done my last one. So uh, unless it's a, a fly-in like Marty does, uh, <clears throat> these uh, old bones are probably uh, going to stay at home and work the D expeditions instead of uh, being at the other end. But uh, anyway, let's uh, let's uh, start off. Um, <clears throat> I'm a uh, I'm an, a transplanted uh, East Coast uh, guy. Uh, I was born and raised in Philadelphia and uh, went to school at uh, Temple University, both for undergraduate and, and for medical school. And when I graduated medical school, then I uh, <clears throat> saw the light and moved west uh, to uh, San Francisco, the University of California, did my uh, internship and surgical residency and urology residency in San Francisco, and I've been a board certified urologist uh, uh, since 1978 and uh, retired from full-time practice in uh, 2010. So I'm enjoying uh, uh, retirement now. Uh, I was first licensed as uh, KN3ANU in 1957, so you can you can do the uh, do the arithmetic and kind of figure out uh, how old I am. Uh, I've held the call N6HC since uh, 1977. That's when they opened up the uh, N6 uh, uh, call sign, uh, uh, and uh, nobody else has held that call except me. And uh, just before I got that call, I I upgraded. Uh, I'd been a general class licensee for a long time saw no reason to uh, upgrade and until I realized that uh, my license was uh, limited because uh, back in the times when uh, you got your general back in 1957, 1958, uh, you had full privileges, but uh, uh, that changed. And uh, I got, I've always been uh, doing contesting and, and I enjoy chasing DX. I, I uh, try to, uh, contribute back to the hobby that I love. I'm a volunteer examiner. I checked uh, QSL cards for awards and uh, and occasionally I, I do talks like this. So these are the de-expeditions that uh, I've been on uh, starting in 2005. I couldn't do any de-expeditions really prior to that because I was in practice and uh, you know when you do a expedition like this, it's a time commitment that's uh, uh, at least three weeks. Uh, and uh, it's kind of hard to leave a, a, a practice uh, for that period of time. Not impossible, but uh, my commitment to my practice uh, superseded uh, uh, playing radio. But uh, once uh, I got the opportunity, uh, I, uh, I took the ball and ran with it. So uh, a bunch of these uh, expeditions have actually been uh, um, awarded the expedition of the year as well. Uh, Midway and Swains Island and uh, Amsterdam Island out in the Indian Ocean, uh, Baker Island. They've all been uh, the expeditions of the year. And quite honestly, they all deserve to be the expeditions of the year. And I felt very privileged to be part of the uh, the team. So. 
<clears throat> what do I do? Because uh, usually uh, when when I'm invited on one of these, um, I'm invited as an operator. I'm invited as a guy to to, to uh, uh, do scut work. I've got to got, got to make antennas and uh, and erect them, and I've got to uh, I've got to set up stations too. But I also have the uh, the privilege of being uh, the uh, uh, the medic for for the team as well. So I don't choose the team. The the, the uh, team uh, the team leader uh, or leaders are the ones that join the team uh, pick the team. And what I do is then I uh, I vet them, and this is a form that I use. I, I copied this one. This is one I use for Amsterdam Island, uh, but it's the same form I use for all of the uh, expeditions. And it's a two-page form, which I email to uh, everybody on the team. I get some demographic information, uh, <clears throat> which you can see on uh, on the front of the, this is the front page. And uh, on the back page, uh, I ask for medical history. Uh, uh, what's uh, strictly confidential. I don't share this with anybody, even the team leaders. Uh, if there's an issue, I will tell the team leaders, I don't think this individual really should go on this trip. Um, uh, only with permission from the individual would I share why. Uh, it's up to the team leaders to trust the doctor who says this guy doesn't belong on the trip. Uh, sometimes they've listened, sometimes they haven't. And unfortunately, some of the times when they haven't, they've paid the price because we've had issues and uh, yeah, it hasn't been pretty. But fortunately, I've never lost anybody. Um, it's interesting to see how people fill this out because a lot of times uh, 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 you've got to remember that most of the guys on these expeditions are you know, average age is about 65, 66 years of age. Uh, we'd love to have younger people on on these expeditions, but you know, like like me, they couldn't get away when they were working. So we've got a lot of uh, geriatrics uh, on the uh, uh, on the team, and I'll get this back and I'll find out that you know they'll they'll say, well, I don't have any medical problems, and then you look at the list of medications that they have, and they're on blood pressure medications and st uh, statin medications and heart medications and lung med medication. Of course, they have problems. They're just being treated for them, and uh, we need to make sure that if if there's a problem along those lines on the trip, uh, that I'm prepared in, in some way or other uh, to, to deal with it. Uh, and, I, and I can't be prepared unless I have the information. The food allergies, for example, are important too, because you know on a lot of these trips, uh, we have to provide our own food. Uh, there weren't any restaurants on Ducey Island uh, you know, there were just uh, palm trees and sand, and uh, and uh, we have to we have to provide the food. And if somebody has a food allergy, we need to know about it because the the individual who's purchasing the food needs to take that into consideration as well. So that's just an exam uh, example of uh, why uh, I have this form and uh, how I use it. So um, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, we also seem to come up against is uh, uh, guys that are overweight. And um, uh, a lot of these guys don't understand if they've never been on a de-expedition before that, that it's very stressful, both physically and mentally. And uh, they really shouldn't be on trips if they're deconditioned. Okay, so <clears throat> I have to put a medical kit together uh, that I carry with me. Uh, it's part of uh, my luggage when we when we fly in to catch a boat or uh, wherever we're going. So <clears throat> this is the uh, inventory. It's a little maybe a little bit hard for you to read, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I have a, a bunch of uh, liquids, different kinds of liquids. Uh, ranging from peroxide to alcohol, and uh, I can include insect repellent and sunscreen and 
uh, and then uh, liquid medications like uh, uh, local anesthetic medications and uh, uh, epinephrine, things like that. Uh, and also some antibiotic medications that are also injectable in case somebody can't take uh, uh, oral pills uh, because of a, a medical issue. Um, some, uh, um, you notice down here, I've, um, I'm prepared for uh, some minor burns with some uh, sulfadiazine cream and uh, and also some uh, some uh, um, a, a lidocaine jelly that uh, we can put on on burns as well. Uh, notice the uh, transderm scope patches. Uh, those are for seasickness. A lot of these trips that I've been on are, are boat trips and. Uh, uh, people get seasick. Uh, fortunately, uh, I'm, I'm not one of them. So uh, uh, I, although I do use a scope patch uh, just as a precaution, but uh, I've never had any real issues with, uh, uh, with seasickness. Um, then I have a lot of oral medications. Uh, these are all antibiotic medications that I uh, take. And I uh, will bring a uh, uh, one antihypertensive, uh, some pain medications down here, antidiarrheals, uh, and uh, uh, something for the for the bowels, a stool softener, laxative, uh, some Maalox, some cold medication, um, throat lozenges, for, especially for the sideband operators, um, uh, steroids, uh, using uh, steroids for a lot of different uses for that. Uh, 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 but pr primarily for uh, insect bites and uh, also uh, uh, as asthmatic attacks. And then some uh, hard medical supplies. Uh, uh, and I do know how to use a Foley catheter, uh, being a urologist. Uh, but I've also got, uh, uh, you know, a nasogastric tube, a lot of, a lot of bandage stuff, uh, sterile surgeon's glove, sterile barrier, uh, a lot of gauze pads, which are sterile. Uh, and by the way, the numbers after these, this is the amount that I have in, in the, uh, in, in the uh, uh, medical kit that I'm, that I'm carrying. Um, and I have uh, uh, sterry strips, I have sutures, suture material, different sizes, um, sterile su uh, surgical instrument pack um, with uh, scalpels and, uh, irrigation syringes and so forth, the uh, syringes and needles. You take a blood pressure cuff, an otoscope, and an ophthalmoscope. Uh, and, and all of it goes in here. And uh, for those of you who have gray hair, you'll recognize this as, a, as an old Samsonite uh, clamshell hard uh, back uh, suitcase. And uh, it's got to be hard back because I've got liquid in there. And uh, uh, and these suitcases get thrown around. So uh, it's good protection uh, for the medical kit. And this, this uh, suitcase with all of the stuff in it weighs exactly 50 pounds, five zero, because that's what uh, the airlines will take. Otherwise, if it's uh, 51 pounds, there's a surcharge that's astronomical. So uh, uh, I try to keep uh, this to... Uh, between 49 and a half and 50 pounds. I've been over a little bit once or twice with 50.2 or something like that. And the, uh, the airlines uh, show pity on me and, uh, uh, and let me through. On one occasion, I got uh, some woman who uh, uh, was, was having some difficulty that day with, with her uh, uh, um, uh, dealing with the public. And, uh, so right there in front of her, I just uh, took something out of the medical kit and put it in my own carry-on, and then it weighed 50 pounds. Uh, <laughs> so there's always a way around it. There's always a solution. So what's it look like? What do I have in here? Well, here we are. You can see, by the way, that uh, I had some betadine that spilled at one time and uh, stained this uh, two suit or suitcase. So I never was able to get that, uh, that, that stain out, but uh, here's, uh, here's one side of the suitcase and uh, here's the blood pressure cuff and stethoscope. And here's the other side of the case. Uh, you can see some 
different fluids and Foley catheter here and some bandages and so forth. Uh, this is some uh, hydrocortisone cream, whole bunch of stuff in here, alcohol swab, so forth. Here's everything out of the suitcase. You see, I, I, I learned a lesson when the betadine spilled, all the liquids uh, go, go in Ziploc bags now that, uh, that could create a problem. So they're in Ziploc bags. These are silver nitrate sticks for, for cautery. And then I also have some ophthalmic uh, um, uh, fire sticks that I can use for cautery as well. So that's, again, one half of the, uh, here's the uh, suture set. Down here I had several suture sets. And uh, this is the other, the other side with a lot of the antibiotics and pills. Here's the uh, fire sticks, the ophthalmic fire sticks. Uh, and uh, lip balm and uh, throat lozenges and so forth. You can see all the all the interesting things that I'm that I'm carrying in that in that uh, medical kit. And then in the the latter part of my uh, de expeditioning career, we started carrying an automatic electronic defib defibrillator, and uh, uh, you can rent these uh, for a period of time. Uh, and uh, and then and then return them after after the trip or or the team can can buy one um, and uh, there everybody should know how to use them and usually when I am on a trip and uh, say we're on a boat trip somewhere and it's it's going to take us five or six or seven days we bring the uh, AED out and I actually give everybody a uh, a little primer on uh, uh, how to use the AED because, you know, I may not be anywhere near the individual that needs an AED right away. And uh, somebody else needs to, needs to take the bull by the horns and, uh, and, and uh, get the, uh, uh, the patient hooked up and, uh, and shocked if necessary. So, so everybody gets a, gets a little course on how to use the AED. And I would highly recommend that that uh, all of you who uh, who travel, even if you're just traveling for vacation, um, you know, you should uh, take a little Red Cross course, or a, a lot of ambulance companies will give uh, CPR courses and learn how to use an AED. Learn how to do CPR. You never know when you're going to need it. Learn how to do a Heimlich maneuver, um, and uh, um, who knows, you may save a life. Um, okay, so I'm also a big believer in responsibility, and uh, I let my teammates know that they have to take responsibility for themselves first, and I'm there secondarily to help them. So what does that all mean? Well, I tell all the, all the uh, team people that they should go to a, a site like this. This is Travel Med. And uh, you uh, go to this site and you put in uh, what part of the world you're going to, what country, and it will tell you what kind of vaccinations you need, what kind of medical problems are endemic to that part of the world, and uh, whether or not it's, uh, it's safe to travel there. So I've got the medical history, you've seen the form, and then they go to this, uh, uh, this site here, and then I tell them uh, sometime within three or four months of the, the trip, uh, they need, definitely need to see their primary care doctor and tell their primary care doctor that uh, they are going on a trip. Uh, there will not be any uh, sophisticated medical uh, uh, treatment available to them and uh, make sure that they're in shape for the trip. And also check up with their dentist about three to four months before uh, a scheduled trip because there's nothing more uh, painful than an abscess tooth. And I'm not a dentist and I don't have any dental equipment. And uh, it's really uncomfortable if you've got some uh, dental problems. Uh, I, uh, at the beginning of my de-expedition career, I recommended that all the team members uh, uh, purchase medical evacuation insurance and uh, and medical insurance for their trip. Uh, uh, toward, towards the end of my 
the expedition experience, experiences, uh, the leaders required this of everybody on the trip. They saw the, the value in this and said, if you don't want to purchase medical evacuation insurance and medical insurance, you're not welcome on the team. Um, uh, most of uh, our, our teammates are covered by Medicare, uh, but Medicare doesn't cover you outside of the country. So uh, you must have medical insurance. Uh, and uh, uh, on uh, multiple occasions, uh, I've had team members who have uh, had to be evacuated and, and have been hospitalized in a foreign country. And those guys were very happy they had purchased medical insurance. And I also encourage the team members to purchase appropriate clothing and footwear. It's really important uh, because a lot of the places that I've gone are hot and, um, uh, and there are coral beaches and, um, and there's a lot of sun and you can get sunburn uh, severely. I've uh, had guys who have gotten second degree sunburns on, on these trips. I've had diabetics who have gotten uh, uh, foot injuries because they were wearing flip-flops instead of uh, uh, tennis shoes or some other water, uh, waterproof type uh, enclosed shoe. And I encourage all of them to get lightweight uh, UV protected uh, long sleeve pants and long sleeve shirts. Now you can buy shirts and pants that are tear off. Uh, so you can walk around in shorts for a short period of time uh, or, or, or no, no full sleeves for a short period of time, uh, but it's not recommended. You can get sunburned pretty severely in about 10 minutes. And, um, um, and I've seen it and it's, it's not comfortable. These, uh, these guys wish they had listened to me. So, and I also require or ask all the team members to make their own first aid kit. First of all, almost everybody's on prescription medications. And I recommend that they take two, two supplies of medications. Uh, one full supply of medications is packed away in their carry-on and one is carry is carried in their in their carry-on luggage sometimes your checked luggage gets lost if all your prescription medication is in there uh you're sol you don't you don't have any medication now and uh, you may never see that medication again you may never never see that bag again so uh, uh always hope for the best but prepare for the worst and uh, so two sets of medications. Uh, if you wear eyeglasses, extra eyeglasses should be uh, carried. Sunglasses should be carried. <clears throat> Always carry sunscreen. And you can get uh, sunscreened uh, lip balm as well. Uh, and I've seen guys who, you know, they, 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 they put the sunscreen on their arms and their legs and, and, uh, and they forget their lips and the uh, they've got these fat lips uh, for the rest of the de-expedition because they're burned. Uh, I ask them to get uh, a little, little tube of antibiotic ointment, make sure they carry insect repellent with them, band-aids and moleskin, uh, pain medication of their, of their choice, be it aspirin, ibuprofen, Advil, uh, whatever. Uh, get motion, uh, bring some motion me uh, sickness medication with them. Um, and they can get the prescription medication from their doctor when they go to see their doctor and, and uh, let their doctor know that they're, they're going on this, this kind of trip. Uh, I, I recommend uh, the scope patch. It's easy to use. You slap it on behind your ear on the mastoid process, and um, it's good for three days. Uh, I've been on trips that have been longer than that, so you need a supply of... Uh, 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 these patches. Uh, uh, most of the trips I've been on have been uh, six to nine day uh, uh, boat ex excursions. Uh, Bouvet was uh, uh, was an exception. That was a 31 uh, day uh, uh, horrible trip. Uh, but we had uh, everybody had plenty of uh, scope patches. And uh, uh, although some people got seasick, it, it wasn't uh, real bad. 
it was manageable. Um, <clears throat> and I carry uh, motion sickness, uh, oral medication, uh, uh, rectal suppositories, and um, uh, an injectable uh, medication for motion sickness as well. And then uh, laxative medication and anti-diarrheal medication. All this, almost all of this stuff is over the counter stuff, and uh, and you, you need to you need to put a first aid kit together. So, but you know, sometimes the guys don't listen and uh, they don't take it to heart. So I am prepared for them, and uh, if they've got an issue, uh, I can take care of it. So this is an interesting little tent, isn't it? Well wonder what that is. Well, I'll tell you what it is. If you look down here, you can see that's a little plastic bag. Holds well, five gallons. And uh, there's a little tube on it. And if you hang that tube up, there's a water in here. And that's the shower. Open this up and uh, bring this bag in. And, you know, in on this hot island, this happens to be Clipperton Island, uh, uh, this water heats up very quickly, and you got yourself a hot shower, and uh, and off you go. But that's not the only little tent that we have on on these trips. Uh, and here I am, since I'm the doctor, I'm I'm part of the uh, uh, the uh, uh, health and welfare of of the team. And here I am starting to dig a long drop uh, to handle our, uh, uh, our bodily waste. And, uh, um, you know, on Clipperton, uh, there's, there are no buildings. Uh, there's, there's uh, you have to be self-sufficient. And here is the uh, bathroom on Clipperton Island. And I've, built several of these on various strips. Uh, four strips of plywood. Here you can see the front strip right here. Two on the side, one on the back. You put a put another piece of plywood up here with a, with a toilet seat on top of it. Uh, here's a little bucket with some toilet paper here. And uh, you should pardon the expression, you're good to go. And uh, um, this hole has to be at least four to five feet deep. Uh, they, th this this one was difficult to uh, to dig because uh, um, this is a coral island, and once you got down around uh, a foot and a half or two feet, it was solid coral. I wish I had had a jackhammer, uh, but we eventually got it deep enough so that uh, uh, we were able to uh, accommodate the uh, uh, everybody for the entire time of this particular expedition. And the uh, team was kind enough to uh, memorialize this uh, crapper for us. Um, okay, so what are the kinds of things that I that I treat on these expeditions? Well, we've already mentioned motion sickness, nausea, vomiting, uh, loss of appetite, dehydration. Uh, these things are not inconsequential because uh, uh, I don't carry IVs. And if I can't uh, uh, get something into you orally, um, you know, uh, we've got a we've got an issue, and uh, so we uh, it's better to um, to treat and prevent motion sickness than have to, have to treat the consequences of motion sickness. And dehydration can lead to constipation and fading. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm constantly going around and encouraging people uh, to uh, to drink. We have uh, lots of water. We also carry Gatorade or some other electrolyte solution. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm constantly reminding guys to drink so that they don't get uh, dehydrated. We've mentioned sunburn. We've mentioned uh, uh, scratch, scratches and abrasions are not uncommon. Blisters uh, from, uh, uh, well, from a lot of different reasons. Uh, and I'll show you, show you a couple of pictures. Uh, diarrhea and constipation. Uh, uh, a lot of this is uh, due to uh, the change in diet because you know you're not eating the same foods that you would normally eat at home, and your diet. Well, if your diet changes, your your GI tract uh, 
uh, notices it and it may react uh, either in one way or the other. And also with stomach uh, upset as well. Uh, insect bites are uh, very common. And you notice I carry uh, uh, sp uh, insect spray uh, and also lotion. And I ask everybody else to uh, carry that as well. Uh, insect bites can be uh, life threatening. If you get a MRSA infection, that's methicillin resistant Staph aureus. And the only way you can treat this is with IV antibiotics. And I've already told you, I don't carry any uh, IV, an uh, IV antibiotics uh, and I have no way of getting uh, that kind of medication into you. Uh, besides the fact that I don't have a bacteriology lab to identify that it's a MRSA infection. And I'll show you one on a, down the picture. Uh, allergic reactions uh, can, can happen. Uh, everybody's sleep deprived on these trips. Um, and uh, because of that, nobody gets enough sleep. And uh, a lot of times when you're supposed to be getting sleep, you have to be out uh, either fixing radios or fixing antennas or doing something else. And so your, your, your sleep cycle is, uh, is interrupted. It's, uh, it's uh, perturbed and, and uh, it's a, it's a real issue uh, to, to uh, get enough, enough sleep on these expeditions. And it also can affect uh, your uh, mental well-being as well. Sprains and fractures, which I didn't put on here, but uh, that's on another slide. Uh, usually the sprains are either back sprain or uh, ankle sprains, and then uh, respiratory infections uh, as well. So this is kind of a thumbnail sketch of some of the commonly treated things that uh, I've uh, either seen or have to be prepared to take care of. So uh, what I don't do is I don't do prostate exams on the, uh, uh, on the trip. Uh, that's why you go see your primary care doctor for four months or so beforehand. But uh, uh, a lot of the guys like to talk about the, their prostate. So, so, uh, so I engage them with that. Okay, so uh, rare conditions that I've had to deal with is uh, 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 earwax. I had one guy that uh, uh, on a trip and he said, you know, those, those high uh, the headsets don't work. I can't hear anything. Uh, and uh, especially on the left side, it's, the left side just doesn't seem to be working at all. And uh, I said, well, let me get a look at your ears. And <laughs> it's... Uh, his ears were plugged up with wax. So uh, uh, we dealt with that. And all of a sudden his Heil headsets were working just fine. Uh, we've had uh, uh, bone fractures. Uh, I've had to deal with an, uh, an ankle fracture on one trip, had to deal with the rib fracture on another trip. Uh, the rib fracture, that was really bad because the guy was having trouble breathing. And I was worried about a pneumohemothorax. Uh, we had to get him evacuated. He was hospitalized for uh, three to four days in, in uh, Tahiti and uh, uh, eventually recovered. Um, uh, it's not uncommon to see lacerations on these trips. Guys get in a hurry. I'm constantly telling everybody, no running, always walk. Uh, be careful about what you do. Uh, use the tools properly. Uh, but uh, even so, uh, we get lacerations. So, Tell you a little story about that as well. Adverse drug reactions. Uh, but, uh, I've got a little story to tell you about that as well. Uh, edema, especially of the legs, uh, guys with cardiac problems. You know, a lot of our, when they're home, they're on a uh, salt restricted diet. You go out on a boat uh, and your uh, your diet is full of salt and your, your body and your, uh, uh, your medications can't handle all that excess salt. You start retaining fluid, and uh, uh, it's a real issue. Uh, we've had uh, uh, some near uh, car congestive heart failure uh, episodes on some of these trips, and asthma, uh, another uh, another issue. I always uh, ask uh, guys with uh, uh, lung problems, especially, to make sure they've got inhalers, lots of them, and and lots of their uh, uh, other medications. Uh, 
because I don't carry inhalers. So conditions that I have not encountered, thank goodness, uh, urinary retention. I uh, haven't had to use my catheter yet. Uh, pulmonary emergencies, we have had asthma attacks, uh, uh, but uh, I was able to manage it with epinephrine and, and steroids. Uh, and you notice I didn't say we managed it with the inhaler because the guy that uh, had the issue uh, had an inhaler that uh, ran out of uh, doses and he didn't have a, another inhaler. So we didn't have that available to us. Uh, hopefully he learned a lesson on that trip. Cardiac emergencies, uh, thank goodness uh, none, but uh, uh, if you uh, follow uh, reports on the expeditions, you know that uh, people have have died on these expeditions. There was a guy that died on an Aves Island expedition. That's a YV, you know, YV nine or something off of Venezuela. There's another guy that went to Clipperton, and uh, when they got back to uh, San Diego, uh, he went to his motel and, uh, uh, and waiting for his. Uh, uh, his uh, plane flight out of San Diego the uh, uh, the next day, and he went to the motel and keeled over and died. Um, stand by one. Hello? Good. Uh, psychotic reactions, uh, uh, eye injuries, and marine hazards. So the, nothing, haven't had anything like that. Uh, no shark bites, although guys uh, do like to swim in the water and cool off. Uh, and there are sharks around all of these places. So uh, fortunately, uh, I don't have to do, I have not, have not had to do any major surgery. Uh, and I, unfortunately, I don't have a, uh, a board certified anesthetist or anesthesiologist with me. So I usually recruit one of the teams, uh, uh, one of the team members, and we have uh, uh, mallets for stakes, so uh, uh, so we're all set for anesthesia and, uh, if we need it. And uh, uh, you got to remember, we don't have uh, everything that you might need uh, <clears throat> when you have an issue, and uh, so we have to do the best we can with what we've got. And this poor guy had a steel plate put in his leg, but uh, uh, not optimal, huh? So uh, this is a this is actually a picture that that was taken by SM5 GMZ on a, our, our St. Brandon trip, and uh, if you look down here, you can see there's a, a, a pretty good laceration that I'm sewing up, and this is a sterile uh, uh, barrier. Uh, you can see I have sterile gloves on, uh, and I've got uh, sterile uh, instruments. And I've cleaned this wound up and I'm sewing it up. And uh, uh, this happened in the middle of the night. This, this is actually not a radio a team member. This was a fisherman who was also on the island and he was walking uh, on the beach at night and ran into uh, some driftwood uh, and uh, it was sharp and it, it cut his leg. Uh, the uh, fishing company uh, that had these uh, fishermen on the, on the, um, on the island uh, were were notified, and they said, "Well, you know, if we can get a boat, it will it will be a day and a half before the boat gets there, and it'll be another day and a half before the boat gets back to uh, Mauritius. And uh, by that time, you're not going to be able to sew this up uh, by primary intention. You're going to have to let it heal by scarring. And uh, so I said, "Okay, I'll I'll sew this up for you." And uh, so Pete, who is uh, uh, a photojournalist, uh, was my assistant. He uh, was also holding the light because we there was no light to, at night on the island uh, except what you provided for yourself. So Pete's holding a holding a light for me so I can see what I'm doing, and then with his other hand he's he's holding a camera. And I asked him not to not to photograph any of this. Uh, but uh, <laughs> he he went ahead and pho photographed it anyway. Uh, and uh, the team leader on this trip uh, submitted this picture uh, to QST when they uh, had the write-up and, 
it got printed. So, so I'm in QST within this picture. So um, this is this is what you get when you get a, a an MA uh, or a PA or a nurse practitioner. Uh, this is why you need a real doctor. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I'm your ticket. Here's my fisherman. I got them all sewed up here and uh, bandaged up. And uh, just before we left, I uh, I took his stitches out. Uh, everything healed up just fine. He was very happy. Uh, now here's a here's another issue. Uh, this is uh, this is a tick. This was also on Saint Brandon. Uh, birds uh, carry ticks, and you know on all these uh, uh, islands there are all these seabirds, and they all carry ticks. And I don't know which ticks are carrying uh, human uh, diseases and which ones are just have uh, bird diseases that they're carrying. So, uh, uh, you know, when we know that we're dealing with uh, a tick infestation somewhere, I, uh, I ask everybody to do a tick inspection once a day at least. And uh, uh, these, the, these little buggers are hard to find. They, they like to hide out in, in skin creases in your groin or between your buttocks or uh, 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 in your arm, under your arms and folds of skin around your neck, uh, behind your ear. Uh, so uh, you really have to look closely and you have to remove them properly or uh, if they're carrying any disease, the disease stays and gets into your system. So here's Anne. Anne, Anne is a real, real trooper. She's been on a couple expeditions that I've been on. And uh, she got her finger caught in a uh, uh, in a door on the ship. Fortunately, she didn't fracture the finger, but she did uh, tear up the skin on the finger. So we had to sew that up. And I had her permission to show this picture. And sometimes uh, the best thing, the best uh, uh, treatment is no treatment at all. Uh, it's, it's best to do no harm. Uh, and only intervene when it's absolutely necessary. So here are some uh, bug bites. <coughs> now this is an ankle, it's hard to tell, but it's an ankle. <coughs> and this, I think this was on Swain's. And I told everybody, you know, long sleeve uh, shirts, uh, long pants, wear socks, uh, wear enclosed shoes, uh, or or uh, high top uh, work boots. Don't wear flip flops. Don't wear shorts. Uh, this guy didn't listen, and uh, the sand flies had a feast on him. And he's all itched, and so he needed uh, uh, you know treatment for it. And uh, uh, fortunately, none of them got infected. But uh, I know he was scratching like a like a hound with fleas, and. Uh, uh, um, he he did have the appropriate clothing with him, and uh, after this, he he wore the appropriate clothing. Now here's another one. Here's a, kind of a heat rash, and this was also kind of itchy. And uh, this was this is not an infectious thing. This is just from skin rubbing together and and uh, getting a uh, little superficial, little superficial skin infections, but uh, an irritation that responds very nicely to uh, st uh, steroid cream and, uh, and some topical antibiotic ointment, things like that. Um, this is the fellow that uh, was a diabetic, uh, was wearing flip-flops on a coral beach. So the coral gets stuck between the sole of the flip-flop and his unprotected foot and uh, caused two blisters. And he didn't know they were happening until they happened because he's a diabetic and he's got diabetic neuropathy, can't feel very well and didn't know what was going on. So uh, by the time he got to me, uh, uh, he'd already taken the skin off of this blister. He wanted to take the skin off of this one. I told him to leave it because it's a good dressing and just keep things cl uh, clean and try to keep it dry, wear the appropriate uh, uh, footwear. And uh, fortunately, uh, even though he's diabetic, uh, uh, with local care, uh, 
Uh, he got better. He healed up just fine. Now, this is the allergic reaction. What? This is an allergic reaction. Well, this is how this happened. Uh, this is a German guy who was on a trip to, uh, to Swain's with us. And uh, he didn't do what I told him to do and get uh, uh, get a checkup with his doctor beforehand. Uh, I reviewed his, uh, so, so he didn't have any uh, seasickness medication, motion sickness medication. So uh, the night before we were able to, we were going to take off uh, on the boat, uh, we put some, uh, we put a, scope patch on him and uh to make sure that he tolerated it and uh when i saw him the next morning he said he was fine um and that kind of brings up uh something that uh, i also tell uh my teammates uh, don't start taking new medication just before the trip because you never know how you're going to react to it so anyway uh we're on this boat trip on the lady naomi on our way to Swain's and uh, uh, it's nighttime. I'm trying to sleep in my cockroach infested bunk and uh, two crew members come up and shake me, wake me out of my deep sleep and say, are you the, are you the doctor? And I said, yes. And they said, well, come with, come with me. So I go with him and they find that they had been doing their rounds around the lady Naomi, uh, you know, uh, making sure everything's okay. And they were finding blood trail uh, all around the, uh, the the deck of this big ship in various places. And they didn't know where it was coming from until they ran into this guy. And he had a uh, this uh, very deep cut uh, on his uh, lower leg. And uh, he was bleeding all over the place. Uh, and he was disoriented. He was out of his head and uncooperative. Uh, this is also a guy that uh, I had told the team leaders not to bring on the de-expedition because he had multiple medical problems. He was in his uh, uh, mid-70s, and he was on a blood thinner. The last thing you want to know uh, about, uh, or the last thing you want to see when somebody uh, has, has a bleeding wound and they're on a blood thinner. So... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, we had to get a couple crew members to hold this guy down because he wasn't cooperating. And um, I sewed up his leg, uh, but, um, uh, you know, him being on blood thinners and me not having vitamin K to try to reverse it, even even vitamin K wouldn't work right away. Um, he was on Coumadin. Um, so he just continued to bleed and he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't stay still. He was bleeding through the dressings, uh, trying to put pressure dressings on him, and it was uh, impossible. And so, uh, fortunately, uh, the trip from Pago Pago to Swains Island was only a, a, like a little, uh, little less than a day and a half. And uh, so I, I didn't let this guy get off the boat when we got to Swains. Uh, I told the captain, take him right back to, uh, to Pago Pago and make sure he gets to Lyndon B Baines Johnson Hospital in uh, Pago Pago uh, to get uh, treated. And uh, so that's what they did under protest. Uh, they, they didn't like it, but uh, uh, that's what they had to do. Um, and this guy did, did uh, uh, recover. Uh, he actually enjoyed his hospital stay. He uh, fell in love with the nurse that took care of him. Uh, uh, married her and took her back to Germany. <laughs> so all's well that ends well, huh? Um, here's an insect bite that got uh, scratched and scratched and uh, it wasn't getting any better. And um, I'm not touching his skin, by the way, with my bare hand. I'm just pointing. You don't have that uh, depth uh, perception in, in this picture, but uh, I'm just pointing. And that was a uh, an abscess developing in the left calf from an insect in, uh, bite that turned out to be methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. I was given this guy uh, an the antibiotics that I had, and he was not getting better. And so I, I kind of suspected he had MSRA, MRSA, and I told him, uh, fortunately, this happened 
uh, at the very end of our expedition. I said, as soon as you get back home, you go to the uh, emergency room or urgent care, have them look at this because I think it's something bad. It turned out it was something bad. He was hospitalized for uh, several days, uh, but he did recover. And I've been on other expeditions with this gentleman since then, and we're still friends. Uh, uh, here's a, a little abrasion that uh, it doesn't look very bad, but it's, uh, the story is kind of uh, humorous. Uh, and uh, this is, a, a, you can see this is a pretty big fella. And this was on uh, Bonaba Island. Uh, we were all uh, bunking in the Bonaba Inn, which is a, uh, a termite infested uh, uh, structure, uh, two, two level structure. Uh, and we slept uh, on the second floor uh, and the, uh, you know, some of the stations were on the first floor of the inn. Uh, and uh, one morning, um, um, we're uh, operating uh, from from uh, the stations down on the first floor when all of a sudden we hear some screaming and uh, we look up and there's this this leg uh, up to about here uh, coming through the second story floor. And this big fella who was weighs about 270, 280, uh, was, had gone through the termite infested floor with this leg and was stuck. He couldn't get himself out. And uh, two guys, uh, it, it took uh, uh, two or three guys to, to pull him out of the, uh, uh, the, the hole that uh, he had fall, created and fallen into. Uh, Fortunately, he didn't do any major damage, so he just cleaned it up, put some topical antibiotic on it, and he healed up just fine. And I've seen him since uh, on another trip, and uh, and and we're still friends, and <laughs> he healed up just fine. So that kind of gives you an idea of uh, uh, what uh, uh, what it's like to be a doctor on a D expedition. Uh, I try to keep my uh, doctoring to a minimum. Uh, and um, um, and uh, and and keep my operating to a maximum. Uh, so, because that's why I'm on the trip. Really, I want to operate. I don't want to. I don't want to play doctor. Uh, but uh, uh, that's the that's the story, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, one last humorous uh, episode. Uh, we were on uh, uh, Ducey Island, and uh, we had to clear some some brush uh, from an area so that we could set up a, a, a operating site. And um, we had a uh, a, um, a chainsaw. The, the boat had a chainsaw. So uh, one of the operators uh, uh, got this chainsaw out and he starts uh, clearing away brush. And he was a little bit cavalier about how he was swinging the chainsaw and he caught his left thigh with the chainsaw. Uh, fortunately, uh, uh, it was uh, just a skin and superficial muscle cut. He, he didn't uh, uh, cut any bone. Uh, uh, so uh, I was uh, able to treat the wound and uh, uh, we got it uh, put back together again. And I I won't mention his name, but I said, listen, don't uh, uh, don't use the chainsaw anymore. Let somebody else use that chainsaw. Uh, uh, like most of the team members, they uh, they look at me and uh, and say poo and uh, and go about and do whatever they want to do. And so he went back and he uh, got the chainsaw and started clearing out some more area and cut himself again. Uh, so now he did it twice. So. The next time uh, the, uh, the team leader said, uh, "Don't you dare touch that chainsaw, uh, or or you're 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 going to find yourself uh, strapped to your cot." Um, and we thought that was the end of it. Well, he went home, and he I, I found out later he he lives in uh, in a, uh, not in the United States, but he, he lives in a foreign country, and he was clearing some brush on his large farm where he has some sheep and uh, uh, he cut himself again with a chainsaw. Uh, this time I got an email from him <laughs> telling me what he had done and uh, 
Uh, he said he had to go to the, the, the hospital and they took care of him. Uh, but he's getting sick and tired of cutting himself with a chainsaw. And I said, there's a solution to that. <laughs> and uh, hopefully he knows what that solution is. So thank you for your attention. Uh, fun talking to you. And uh, I hope uh, you got a little bit of entertainment and a chuckle or two. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Barry, how are we doing in chat? We've got one good question that I think will get an interesting answer since he's the doctor. Where does drinking water come from and how do you know it's safe? Um, drinking, we, we bring our own drinking water on these trips, bottled water. And uh, we always have an excess. Um, on most of the boats, uh, in fact, all of the boats that we're on um, are able to generate their own water from salt water potable water from salt water. So so we have two sources, the boat or bottled water. So that's never an issue. Okay, you never use uh, water treatment uh, pills and uh, that kind of thing? Now, I don't I don't know that we've ever had to use any pills. The uh, the water treatment plan on the boats, I mean, you get pure water out of that. And uh, yeah, that's true. and and the bottled water is as pure as you're going to get, so Mm -hmm. plus, I would think that because of the, plus we have the water, other, plus we have other liquids would, on the trip. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Alcohol is good. Other liquids that uh, have alcohol in them and uh, uh, and sugar, uh, uh, soft drinks and uh, beer and things like that. So we, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, the the real issue is not uh, uh, do we have enough liquids. The real issue is reminding people to drink. Okay, I think that pretty well answers that. And that's all the questions from chat, but I see you got a couple of hands raised, Dan. Okay, well, go ahead, uh, speak up. Yeah, um, there's a, Marty, when you, if you already got your, uh, uh, if you come on to speak, please make sure your camera's on. Marty, go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh... Arnie, thank you so much. This is a great uh, presentation, fascinating. And having been on a lot of fly-in trips, I can see a lot of those things that you recommend are very much applicable, even if you're not going on one of the week-long boat trips. Uh, and many of the things we already practice, and it really is, uh, it, it, it can be the difference between a great trip and a horrible trip. So thank you for those great reminders. Um, question, I, I noticed that your your uh, tenure on these trips goes past your uh, formal retirement as an MD. The question, do, have you had to keep up your medical uh, malpractice insurance in order to, which seems pretty expensive, I would assume, in order to uh, serve as the uh, trip doctor? Uh, I keep up my medical license, my California medical license, uh, as part of the uh, agreement package that team members have to sign is a hold harmless clause for everyone, the team leaders, uh, the team doctor, uh, and, and all the teammates. So we all promise we're not going to, we're not going to sue anybody. Uh, now that doesn't mean that people, uh, can't sue. I mean, anybody can sue anybody, uh, but but it becomes kind of expensive uh, and uh, problematic if you're if something happens in uh, um, Ducey Island uh, under the uh, auspices of uh, Pitcairn Island and New Zealand and you you have to file a lawsuit there you can't <laughs> file a lawsuit in the United States the tort didn't happen in the United States so you know it's it becomes an issue. All right. Uh, the, I only know of one uh, one time when when uh, team leaders were, were were sued, and that was uh, uh, if you'll remember uh, W two I J J uh, J Coblin, and he had he ran a uh, uh, an expedition out in the South Pacific somewhere. I can't remember. I think it might have been Palmyra or something. And there was a fly, it was a fly in and uh, the plane crash. They had a they had a plane crash and one of the one of the team members 
had a broken leg or something in the crash and they, then they tried to sue Jay and a bunch of other people uh, because the, the plane wasn't uh, uh, maintained properly and so forth and so on. Uh, that, that suit went nowhere. Uh, and again, it, it went nowhere because I think because there was a hold harmless clause uh, signed. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, uh, Paul, you're, you've got your hand up. Take it away. I'm sorry? No, no Paul has his hand up. I asked him to oh. come up. There, I'm unmuted. I was going to say, in uh, in my area of Oregon, we've had a lot of uh, heat, way, way hotter than most people are used to for way, way longer than most people are used to. So most of the public and the media is uh, all saying, yeah, we have to, you know, drink lots of water, drink lots of water. So other than someone that's diabetic or has a special issue, I'm trying to teach people the next step to that is you have to drink enough water until you have sufficient urination, then you'll know you're getting enough. Because if you're drinking a certain amount of water and you think it's enough, but you're not urinating, you're in trouble. That, that's true. But you'll you'll notice that um, a lot of my trips, I mean, they, they go back to 2005, before the media kind of picked up on the the need for drinking drinking water uh, to keep uh, keep hydrated. And the other thing is that uh, older people. Uh, like myself uh, and everybody else, uh, apparently, who's uh, tuned in to here, uh, you know, we we don't do as well uh, with managing water because of uh, uh, maybe some slightly impaired kidney function. And uh, so so you do need to uh, be very cognizant of uh, of uh, keeping yourself uh, well hydrated. Better to be well hydrated than under hydrated. No, so I mentioned that mostly well, because there was one fellow who was uh, quite proud of the fact that he only urinated once a day, which I thought, yeah, for a lot of people, that might not be enough. Sorry, Dan. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, well, Gene, you've got your hand up. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, just basically right now, just one question. When y'all go on your D expeditions or anybody who goes on D expeditions, to a place outside of the United States, obviously. Do you notify the host government or the uh, governing body that y'all, number one, obviously I think you do let them know that you're gonna be there, but do you let them know of the general medical status of the individual participants in the de-expedition? Okay, well, that's a, uh, a multi multi part question. So let me take it one at a time. Uh, first of all, uh, you we always have to notify uh, the government uh, uh, of the place that we're going to uh, because we need permission to go there. Okay, you just can't you just can't land on Ducey Island, for example, or you just can't land on one of the French uh, islands in the Indian Ocean. You need permission to go there. And that permission has to be in writing, by the way, because one of the reasons we go is to activate that uh, entity and uh, everybody that we contact uh, wants to be able to submit uh, proof of that contact to the league or to CQ uh, awards to get credit for that contact. Well, uh, we have to prove to ARRL and to CQ that we had permission to go there. And we have to, and that has to be in writing. So that's always provided uh, to, uh, uh, to the governing body. Um, whether uh, uh, we do not have to notify the, the, the government about the health status of our team, they could care less. Uh, if somebody keels over, though, they, they just want to know that you dug a hole deep enough to put them in, uh, or or evacuated the uh, uh, the, the body. Uh, they 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 don't care uh, what the health status is of of our team. That that's that's something I care about. Okay, do you do like a recon of medical facilities as close as possible to the D expedition site? You know, kind of like just uh, just in case. Okay, well, 
the nearest medical facility off that island or area is two hours away. What preparations do you have to have or make in mind uh, to basically plan, okay, this happened, we got to get them somewhere? Every Everybody knows uh, where the closest medical facility might be. Everybody on the team knows, knows that. Uh, and if they're not comfortable with that, they shouldn't go on the trip. Um, and uh, how close or how far away it is depends on where we're going. Uh, when we went, to, again, let's say we went to Swain's, uh, uh, th there's nothing on Swain's. There's no medical clinic there. Uh, I'm it. And uh, you can't fly a plane there. You can't fly a helicopter there. It's too far. Uh, no place to land. Uh, so it's a boat trip. So, uh, and the boat didn't stay with us. So if you have somebody with a medical problem, you have to call for a boat from Pago Pago. And if you can get a boat to come out, that's a day and a half, plus a day and a half getting back to Pago Pago to, uh, uh, to, the, to the hospital there. Um, when we were on uh, Pitcairn, Pitcairn, uh, uh, they, they have a contracted physician uh, on the on Pitcairn Island. So I, I was really happy about that because uh, I was more than happy to, to say to the uh, the lady doctor that was there, uh, hey, you know, I'm I'm an MD, but uh, 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 you're the doctor here. So uh, you take care of everybody and I'm here and you can consult me if you need to. And she said, you know, that basically I'm telling her I'm not going to step on your toes because uh, uh, this is this is your uh, this is your area. Well, uh, we had a guy who uh, broke some ribs. He uh, he uh, tripped uh, getting on the boat uh, in Mangareva, uh, uh, and the boat trip was uh, uh, three days um, and um, uh, one way and. Um, uh, he was having trouble breathing. The uh, the medical clinic at the uh, on Pitcairn has a portable X-ray unit, but it was broken, so I couldn't get a chest X-ray. Uh, and uh, uh, I didn't feel comfortable taking care of this guy uh, without the appropriate uh, equipment. The uh, resident physician didn't feel comfortable, so we did have uh, the boat. We had the uh, the uh, Braveheart with us. They stayed with us. So uh, uh, they uh, they uh, were able to take him back to uh, to Mangareva, uh, which is a little island in is part of French uh, Polynesia. Well, but on Mangareva, all they have is a little outpatient clinic, and and the only way to get back to to uh, uh, Tahiti uh, is uh, uh, one flight a week uh, from Mangareva to Tahiti. Uh, so um, that's what we had to do with this guy. And fortunately, there was the fl the flight was full, but fortunately, somebody uh, uh, agreed to uh, not fly and to stay behind so that this guy could get on the get on the flight and, and go back to Tahiti, where there was a regular hospital to, for him to be treated uh, uh, in. But uh, you know, everybody knows that. Uh, hey, listen, if something serious happens, you're you're going to be in deep water, and uh, if that you're not comfortable with that, don't come on a trip. Trips not for sissies. <laughs> okay, uh, Marty, I think you had a couple of experiences with on your last trip. Didn't you get uh, fall ill with something? Uh, well, actually, we've had a we've had a couple. Uh, one where uh, in uh, we were in the Gambia. Uh, in West Africa, and uh, uh, a couple of the guys decided to uh, sample the local fish, which if you look at the fish market, it's sitting outside in the sun with the flies. And for some reason, after dinner, they got very, very uh, ill, <laughs> sick to their stomach. Uh, uh, fortunately, it resolved itself. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've, we've certainly had our share of the, you know, the cuts and bruises and so on. Uh, Arnie was mentioning, you know, coral and, and the, the fact that this stuff is sharp. And, uh, uh, when we were on, uh, Rarotonga, uh, all the antennas were going up on 
on a basically a coral beach. There was very little sand. And so one of the things I did in prep was to get some uh, uh, Salomon uh, who makes ski shoes and ski boots and so on. They also make water shoes that are big, heavy tread. And, you know, they you can get, get them soaked and they dry out right away, but it's full protection around your feet. And boy, was I glad I had that, you know, because you almost stumble once in a while. If you stumble, you'll cut yourself. Uh, so that gave us a lot, much better footing. And uh, they've been with me on every every water-based trip since then. Um, Arnie, I was wondering about the uh, the this evacuation insurance. That's that's good to know about. Um, uh, does that is that just a matter of paying for what you would get anyway, whether you had it or not, uh, or does it does it add some special facilities that aren't available to people who don't have the insurance? Well, your medical insurance doesn't include evacuation insurance. Does not, right? So if you need to be evacuated from someplace, um, you need to have that insurance. And it's very expensive. I mean, you know, uh, calling, uh, you know, a private plane in to uh, um, uh, to take you somewhere could be $30,000, $40,000. So, uh, you know, it's not like a, a regular commercial uh, ticket. Um, in many respects, it's it's almost a laugher, though, because, uh, for example, on Ducey, uh, you can't, to evacuate somebody uh, acutely, it's impossible because there's no place to land a plane. It's too far from anywhere for a helicopter. Uh, so how do you evacuate somebody? Uh, you evacuate them on a boat. And the closest place to evacuate them, where there is a landing strip where they can get to some medical care, is three days away. Plus, if you get there on the wrong day and there's no flight. So, um, uh, but, but if you can get evacuated, it's good to have the insurance because uh, it can be extremely expensive. What what source do people usually go to for, you know, like those of us on Medicare, as you mentioned, uh, I'm sure that's a lot of the U.S. operators. Uh, what are the typical sources they go to for that temporary medical insurance? Uh, well, you can go online and just get, you know, uh, uh, travel insurance. Uh, the, uh, uh, the airlines, when you buy your ticket, uh, will sell you travel insurance. Uh, you have to be really careful about what you're buying. You know, uh, uh, people think, oh, it's travel insurance. Yeah, okay, you know, and uh, oh, look, this one, this one's going to cost me $150. And go, oh, gosh, this one costs $350. Oh, I'm not going to get that $350 insurance. I'm going to get a $150 one. Yeah, because, you know, I'm not going to use it well. And then it turns out they need it. And it turns out that uh, what they needed it for is not covered by the $150 policy, but it is covered by the $350 policy, but you didn't buy that. Uh. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you have to be really careful about what you're, what you're purchasing. Uh, and there's lots of sources out there. I used um, a DAN, a Divers Action Network. Uh, they write insurance for uh, scuba divers. And I've been, I was a member of Dan. I kind of dropped my membership at this point. But for, for years, I've been a member of Dan. I'm not a scuba diver, uh, but, you know, you pay you pay your dues, uh, which are very reasonable. I think it was $35 a year. And then uh, they will write you insurance. And they're real good about evacuating people because when they have to evacuate somebody, it's a real emergency because they're talking about, you know, uh, dive emergencies. And if you don't take care of somebody quickly, they're going to die. So. Thank you. So that's uh, that. That was my source, Dan. Oh, good to know, uh, Barry. How are we doing in chat? There's two questions. Uh, let's see where was that? Do you encourage more doctors to volunteer to go on D expeditions? Um. Well, I think that uh, uh, it's important to have some kind of medical professional. Uh, on on the on a trip where there isn't medical uh, care going to be rapidly available, uh, 
what you probably don't know, uh, having asked that question, is that there are an awful lot of doctors who are de-expeditioners, some who uh, I'm sure you probably know of, Glenn Johnson, W0GJ, um, uh, Ralph Feeder, K0IR, uh, Alan, uh, gosh, I forget Alan's last name now, K, K6SRZ, and, and there's a, a whole bunch of uh, doctors that are uh, actually hams. So they're closet doctors and active hams. And, uh, uh, and they, you know, and, and they go on these trips and they're, you know, they're highly sought after. Um, and they're good operators too, I might add. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, with the team really suffers when they're taken away from the operating site and have to have to do doctoring. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, follow up with that, does every de-expedition have a full doctor or are they required to have a full doctor or can they use other levels of medical expertise? Well, you know, there's there's no requirement. I mean, these are private trips. So, uh, you know, you can talk about, is it prudent to go on a, a trip to a deserted desert island without any medical professional and, and you know, no medical kit? Uh, you know, and uh, I've got an answer for that one, uh, and I'm sure you do too. Uh, but uh, as far as a requirement is concerned, no, there's no requirement. Okay. And someone made a comment that Global Rescue is a group that caters to hunting safaris. So maybe it's a place to contact for deep expeditions. Global Rescue? Mm hmm And it's a, what will you say? You said something after that? They cater to hunting safaris. Oh, hunting So you're going to go into Africa. So they probably have an idea of how to do uh, rapid extractions if they had to. But see, they can, they can land a plane. They can take a crop duster into the savannah in, in Africa and land a plane mm -hmm. on the and get, and get somebody to a hospital very, very quickly. Uh, you can't do that on these de-expeditions. De there's, no, there's no place to land. Well, you, you can always bring, you're all U.S. citizens, they can always get a Navy ship that has a helicopter on it to swing by and helicopter you off if you have to, because I know I've done it before. <laughs> sure. Yeah, well, the helicopter has a range. And the ship comes close to the island and the helicopter goes off of the ship, comes onto the island, picks up the patient and brings it back to the ship with his medical facilities. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. I don't know why somebody's dreaming up a good story here. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, we. Uh, it's uh, hard enough to get permission to uh, to to get a, get to some of these places, let alone uh, get permission from the Navy to put a, a an aircraft carrier off the island with a, with a hospital. <laughs> Not an aircraft carrier. The little destroyers that'll go off. That have helicopters that could do that. Right. They get the stuff the cameras on. Okay. <laughs> and Gene has his hand up. That's all the questions in the chat. Okay, thanks. Gene, go ahead. Okay, first of all, great presentation. Uh, a lot of good information out there. And as I was trying to say, was that uh, your little medical kit there in that Samsonite briefcase, suitcase, whatever you want to call it, I did not notice anything to take care of broken bones, basically fractures. Did I miss something? No, nope, you didn't. No, my admonition to the team is don't break any bones. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm, I'm sure they'll be right on that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I told you we had one guy that uh, uh, that did break, break an ankle. And, uh, I mean, we were able to splint it. Yeah, and, drift driftwood and spare coax. Yeah, yeah, we <laughs> split it, uh, and I told him, you know, you really need to stay off of this uh, uh, for the rest of the trip. This happened at the beginning of the trip, and and he was one of the leaders, and he said, "No, I'm split it, and uh, I'm going to walk on it." And he did. Uh, as far as the rib is, uh, the the other fracture that I had to deal with was a rib fracture, and. Uh, uh, there's no way to splint a rib fracture anyway. So, uh, you know, and anything, uh, any bones, any any bigger than that, uh, uh, that's that's an issue. 
That's that, that's All right, well, thank you for sharing the information. Pardon me. Thank you for sharing that information. Welcome. Well, it's been a great presentation. There's lots of comments about that in chat. I really appreciate you coming on. I think uh, Marty is, is the reason you're here. So thank you to Marty. And, uh, well, I sure, Arnie, we sure appreciate it. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, Arnie has hosted a number of uh, uh, talks about trips uh, at his home, uh, very generously had local folks there. And uh, he's not quite local to me, but it's worth the trip to come and hear some of these stories. And uh, uh, as I say, the ones we do are are very tame compared to the ones that uh, Arnie and his teammates undertake. So everybody appreciates it. And Arnie, thanks again for your time tonight. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure, Marty. Great to see you and uh, everybody else here. Uh, uh, Carl, great to, great to see you. And hi to Vicki. And uh, uh, if uh, uh, I've got a lot of other uh, interesting uh, uh, presentations uh, that uh, if you're uh, interested, I'll be happy to come back and uh, and try to entertain you and uh, and uh, educate you as well. So I think thank you. Very interested in that. We're going to be pressuring Marty to, to keep on top of that. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Barry, how are we doing in chat? We are all up to date. Okay, with that in mind, we're running a little over, but it's been great, well worth it. I'll say 73 is everybody. See you tomorrow night.